The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Capital Preferences, ACN 662-118-710, ABN 58662-118-710, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Dean Holmes from the Wealth Network, and welcome to this podcast series where we discuss the different preferences that clients may have and how by understanding these, advisors can gain deeper client insights, helping them to provide better advice. Capital Preferences sponsored this podcast to bring you stories of advisors as light bulb moment makers. Their interactive research-backed client experiences give advisors the richest, most reliable understanding of their clients. With revealed preference technology, you can see tomorrow first and be the trusted sense maker clients choose again and again. 2,000 advisors are already using Capital Preferences with 400,000 clients around the globe and it's now available in Australia. Join them. Welcome to episode four of Revealed Preferences, the key to deeper client understanding and better advice. In this episode, we're going to be talking about how a client's risk preference can change over time. Pinpointing those changes can support a positive, personalized advice experience and really ensures that clients are invested as they should be across time. We'll talk about how to reprofile without creating heaps of work for yourself or your clients. Today, I'm joined by Louise Parker to talk about these client changing preferences, how to spot the shifts and what to do about them. Welcome, Louise. Thanks, Dean. And yes, Louise Parker. I've been in the industry since 1989 and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. And, And with these tools and how I run my business, it just makes it more efficient, makes it a better experience for the client. And uh, I recently moved from Melbourne to Gold Coast and now Port Douglas and uh, loving it. So uh, I'm all about, you know, there's a lot of tech out there, but I'm all about making sure the tech works. So I've been using Capital Preferences now for, gosh, since 2017. Uh, before I went on that study tour to uh, Berkeley College and met the professor. Yep, so I've been using Capital Preferences since 2017, as I mentioned, and the tool actually used to be called True Profile. So you might hear me refer to it as that today. But yeah, I use Capital Preferences Risk Profiling Suite to risk profile my clients, but it did used to be called True Profile. So if you hear me say that, that's why. Excellent. So we'll get into a little bit of the detail around that, but obviously a great career so far, Louise, in terms of seeing a lot of things change since 1989. So we'll uh, we'll delve into the, that a little bit as as we go. So tell us a bit about what advice was like uh, in that first 10 years of your career. Were you actually doing risk profiles at that point in time? That's the funny thing. Risk profiles never came in until there was uh, a, a lot of complaints, I guess. Uh, to the government and and consumer places where they were turning around and saying, hang on, I didn't know I was invested in shares and I didn't know. So that's when it sort of came out. And it, it's a great, great journey for the client to to ensure that they understand where they're invested and that things can go up and down. And and even though it seems like a, a basic thing and, and it's blasé, there's a lot that goes into a risk profile. Excellent, excellent. So you started using uh, the software as the as the solution back in 2017. What were you What were your challenges with the traditional method of of risk profiling, which I which I assume back then was a, was sort of a multiple choice question or something like that? How did that work in your advice practice, and what were the issues that you were coming up with going through that journey? Yeah, the the biggest issue I've always had is. A client will turn around and say, that's what I pay you for. You tell me where to invest. And so if they don't understand it's, I've got to build something to where they're comfortable. Yes, I can push them out of their comfort zones, but ultimately they need to know what to expect so that they're not ringing me on the phone going, hang on, 
the stock market just crashed, 10 million's been wiped off, what the hell's going on? Uh, so it's a, a great education tool as well as making sure that a person's invested and knows where they're invested. I've always said to a client, there's three things, you know, how, where, and why it does what it does. And I think that's important to convey to a client so that they they take ownership. Excellent. So t- tell us a little bit more about that. So you said how, where, and why. What's the how? Yeah. So the how is, okay, how are we going to get you to your goals? And you need to know a client's risk profile to be able to do that because there's no point saying, well, this is the goal I want and I want all my cash in the bank. <laughs> it, it's not going to usually sort of generate along that line as in how how are you going to do it? How are we going to invest the money? You know, can they do it and and just be in cash? The where is, okay, where are we going to place the funds? Okay, which is not an issue, but you need to know through their true profile and their, their capital preference as to how much is going to go into shares, how much is going to go into to the, that asset allocation. Then the when well what was it where the why and why and that's the main important thing is why we're doing this why we've got to have you in this this bucket approach or or true profile to be able to ensure that they get the most out of it and and we get them on their way. So what was what was broken? Did the paper form not do that, or what was broken? Yeah, the the look. I don't want to get myself in compliance trouble here, but even sometimes, you know, you had to really step the client through those questions. And I understand why people just send it out to the client, but I don't like that either. So I've tried a lot of ways over the journey and over the time to ensure that, okay, sit in front and you go through. And and I don't like doing that either because you're guiding the client technically. Mm. Because they look at you for for guidance. Visual cues yes. and guidance, absolutely. That's right. If you post it out or send it out to them um, via My Prosperity, then what happens is they go, Lou, I, and they have no context and no idea. So by doing it and, and saying to them, okay, I'm going to send out, and I hate using the, what, the, the word it's a game because it's not a game to a a client, it's their money. Mm. So it's a case of, I usually say it comes out, it's six scenarios and those scenarios differ. You do whatever you're comfortable with. And and that's virtually all I have to say. And the clients pick it up. They love it. They just put that little bar across (laughs) and slide it across to what they're prepared to gain and what they're prepared to lose. Absolutely. It, it it is it is simple and it's and it's easy for the for the clients to do it. And I like the point that the risk profiles that we do in front of the clients is that if we go through that journey, we inadvertently lead them down a path. And we might have thought uh, we may think that that's education, which there is an element of educating clients around investments. But financial literacy overall is relatively low uh, across the across Australia and the and the and the world. And so, We've got to come up with a way in which clients can make a relatively comfortable decision, and this win loss or gain and gain and loss element seems to be working in the terms of psychology of clients to identify these these preferences. So, Louise, you went in two thousand and seventeen to to Berkeley. Uh, tell us a bit about what got you over there, what you learned, what was the jaw dropping moments of that of that journey in in this part. Yeah, so we got to spend the day with the professor and he is absolutely awe-inspiring. I I could never understand why people would want to carry on and go to school longer and longer and longer, um, as in go to uni and do this course and this course and this course. But now I understand why they pay professors the big bucks because they know how to teach and and everything just Honestly, it was a light bulb moment because I'd been using True Profile before that, mm-hmm. and and trying to educate my clients and and going, you know, what is this really trying to to prove? But the way he explained it, the science behind it, it makes sense, 
and it's proven. And I guess that's the big light bulb moment I had is that, hang on, we're not just guessing in the client's you know, that has financial literacy at a low point is trying to answer these questions, these, you know, 10, 12 questions um, that is in a normal risk profile. And it's and it's true. This is like a, a general practitioner and a specialist in that you can either just, you know, see the, the risk profile as per the questions or you do this, capital preferences true profile and it is like an x-ray the client may think that they know where they're at but this is scientific proof where I can turn around and say this is where you are this is you know I've looked under everything the nooks and crannies the bone you know this is the bones of where you you need to be or or how you will react to different risk profiles and and different returns Mm. And this is in a, this ends up being in six simple questions, uh, which which obviously makes the the process easier at the end of the day. So, in terms of your clients, so how talk to us firstly about how you position this risk profile for for a new client, and then after that we're going to go into a little bit more detail about how we're going to do it. Uh, how you do it every year with clients as well. But what's the story and explanation that you provide to clients before you hit the send button or or get this profile out to them to do it? So what happens with a first appointment is I will sit down with the client, usually over Zoom, we'll complete the personal financial questionnaire and I'll delve into what they're wanting to do. I will then also explain to them that I've sent them through my prosperity, a true profile link. Uh, and the reason why I use and and copy that link into my prosperity is because I have I tell all clients, new clients, never click on any links. It's just too dangerous these days. And so when it's in my prosperity, I know that it's a safe link and that they know they can then they can click on that. So when I send out the true profile via the link. They may sometimes complete that with me, depending on reading the situation and, and what time we've got left. Um, I educate them and sort of tell them that, you know, markets go up and down. This will be able to give me a full indication of where you sit and what you're comfortable with, and I get them to complete it. If it's a couple, I like each one of them to complete it uh, because, yeah, there, there's, look, I would say seven out of 10 clients are the same um, because they've been married a long time, but there's always that two or three where, yeah, they're on completely different <laughs> planes and um, and so we need to address that. So when they have completed that, True Profile then sends me a report and I get notified instantly when they've completed it and I'll go in there and I will download it and look at their results. The results are very, very interesting. They're in depth. I know I can then, and it gives me everything to then either send it to them and see what they say, or if it's different to what we've gone through in the initial appointment, I will set up another time with them to have a 15 minute, half an hour call with them to then go through the results. Excellent. And the difference between couples and singles in that conversation How are you tackling that next element of saying, well, how am I talking to clients that have two different profiles and how do you navigate that part of it? Yeah. And that's the beauty of true profile or capital preferences. It will actually go through and when you're showing the client and presenting those results, you can show it all there as to where they need to be and where they should be. And it it just makes it a, a greater conversation to get both of them either on the same page or her money there, his money there. And yeah, you've, you've really got to read the client. Excellent. And the journey that we, that we wanted to talk about with you as well, Louise, is that the journey of how these preferences change over time. So we, we broadly know that clients should or do become more conservative over time as they move from accumulation into retirement phase. And so you've been using the, you've been risk profiling for a long period of time, obviously with, you've had clients for a long period of time. So over your journey, you may have seen that and it's good to understand 
how you've experienced that with your clients and how is this, how are you seeing it in the results of the software and what are you doing as a result of that? Yeah. With the new version of True Profile, it has been fantastic because it, it, it gives you that, that deeper client experience. They do change, but strangely enough, you'll find, well, I've found in, in my circumstances, clients that have been with you a long time, yes, go, why do I have to do that again? You know, Lou, I leave it up to you. And when they do it, you actually, they, they want to take on more risk. That happens mm. more likely because they're comfortable and they trust you. So they're like, they don't see the ups and downs because of the strategy that I've put into place. Mm -hmm. And so they go, Lou, yep, yeah, comfortable. And it comes out differently that they are happy to take on more risk. Mm. I'm the one that turns around and says, no, no, no. At this stage of your life, you don't need to take on extra risk. You've got enough money. We can do that if you want. But, you know, you don't want to be the richest person in that cemetery. So don't take the risk. You don't need to. And and so we have that conversation um, and it comes around that. Yes, there's clients and it really depends what's going on in the world as to whether they will be more conservative. So when COVID hit, yes, they become a little bit more conservative because they didn't know what was happening in the world. Mm. But you'll you'll probably find nine out of 10 times they'll stay where they, they normally are because it's an x-ray of what lies underneath their feelings, not just on a whim or a, a whimsical. You say COVID. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Like if you use COVID as the example, like when you're going through this process, COVID doesn't flash up on the questionnaire as a, as a, as a, risk factor it's sort of the as you said before the game the game part of it so these short-term noises don't necessarily appear which is which is really interesting um in terms of the x-ray into people's people's preferences and also the the element of that clients may be willing to take more risk as they age but but more importantly, it's they're willing to they may be willing to take more risk as they grow in experience and confidence in working with an advisor. And so wow. that's the unadvised versus advised insights that perhaps the we get more confidence as we get older because we have experience, but also we're 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 with a partner such as yourself that's then guiding us through. And so we said, well, I'd like to take a little bit more risk. Uh, through through the through that process as a, as a result, and right. so do you. Are you disciplined now in terms of your business in sending out this profile to every client at the same time of year, coming into their annual review? What what do you do in that regard? So what I love about it is that I can put to remind me in three months to re do it, six months or twelve months, and so it will automate and do that. Uh, which is great. I always make sure, and and that's really important for new clients because you know sometimes you can feel that they're they're happy to take on more risk or or they're saying more risk, and even though the X rays come back and, and they're conservative, for them to reach their goals, they need to come out of that comfort zone and be balanced. So it, it's depending on the the situation and the client, and you can see all that in the in the response from True Profile is you want to be able to make sure that each year it goes out as part of the review process before you actually meet with the client again so that you can have those more rewarding conversations, do a presentation because there's a present button on True Profile. Um, so there's a report free and there's a report to present. Yep. Um, and, and it works in really, really well so that you can preempt and send it out once they've done it, before the appointment, but you can still present at the appointment to be able to say, okay, where do we go from here? Do we need to change? Are you still comfortable? Uh, is this where you want to be? Excellent. And the the interesting thing, Louise, is that clients don't know that they're going to be risk profiled when they start a relationship with a financial advisor. It's not a concept that they were ever uh, aware of the process, but then I suppose they get used to it year after year that something may change and they enjoy doing this process. 
Yeah, look, you you always get the ones that like, oh, no, not this again. It hasn't changed from last time. Well, humor me. <laughs> Let me see how it, uh, it affects and, and whether you're still on track. And so I use it more like that saying, we just need to keep you on track. So let, let's, can you complete it? And, and then I can confirm that you're on track. Absolutely. And, and that's have a problem with that. And that's the GP, isn't it, Louise? Like you go and see the doctor once a year to check that everything's okay. Think of that financial health check or the health check. Yes. You can't tell the doctor that you think your ticker's okay because <laughs> you, you can walk up the steps and you don't, you don't lose a breath. So that's right. the same element is here is if this is an x-ray into your, your preferences, which is better than what we know ourselves, then we have to do these things every year just to check that everything's okay. And clients, once they're working with you, obviously they start to do what they're told uh, in this regard as well. For advisors, Louise, what would you tell advisors that just do risk profiling once? So the data from Capital Preference is like one in 10 advisors like only, only profile their clients once. Uh, and then there's only a su- another subset that only that try to do it every three or four years, for example. What would you say to advisors on how to get over that hump and what is the benefit to the client conversations that you're having? Yeah, it's exactly like you just said, Dean, in that this is a check to make sure you're still on track. So it, you get no comeback in, in not wanting to do it. The reason why it has to be done each year and why I've done it each year is because it just reiterates to the client and it gives them that opportunity to ask questions, to get their education up and not feel bad about feeling like, geez, I I don't know what I'm talking about and and I have low financial literacy. No one comes out and says, I've got low financial literacy. It, it, It just doesn't happen. So therefore... By doing this, you're giving the the space available to a client to come out with questions. To um, you know, I always say there's no such thing as a, a stupid question. There's just a dumb answer I can give you, and you know, it makes a client laugh, and and they they just feel more comfortable. And doing it each year, they come to expect it. And look, there's been times where I've just gone, I can't. I can't deal with this client to do this again this year. And so sometimes I will miss it. And it's amazing how they come back and go, where's that game? I, I want to do those mm, questions mm. because they just know it's part of the process and it, it works well. That's Don't fun. get backlash. That's that's good. And so the advisors that are that are only doing it once a year, there, there's some of the research that the, the Capital Preferences Ensemble did was all about that. The, there's an increase in like the NPS net pro bono score. So clients overall are happier as a result of increasing the frequency around uh, the the discussion of risk and investment risk and their preferences, as well as the intention to increase uh, funds under advice. So there, right. there's this confidence that happens between the client and advisor because we're following a disciplined process around their preferences and it makes clients happier as a result. Advisors are missing an opportunity, and that's what it is. I, I mean, I have so many clients, and my business has just been based on referrals because you're getting you're getting that one level deeper, or, or quite a few levels deeper, and clients feel comfortable. I, I mean, my, I mean, yeah, you could go back to my clients and say, you know, are you happy with Louise or? And I'm sure nine out of ten, you know, because the, all of them refer to me. Um, there's not a client that that does not that I know of that doesn't refer when there's an opportunity there or a mate or a friend. There's look, so many clients ring me and say, "Look, I, like you know, your client has uh, or, or a friend of mine has referred," and I say, "Oh, uh, can you let me know who it is? Because otherwise, I, d- I don't take you on as a client because I, I'm just too busy." but I will for my existing clients if they refer me. And it's a case of that strength and that bond. They turn around and go, look, I'm so sorry. They referred me like three, four years ago and I haven't rung until now. And it's all because you build up that that nice rapport with your client because you're going in deeper. Mm. Any advisor that only does it once a year or once every two years, because I know that licensees were saying at that 
point in time. You only have to do it once every two years. I always just do it every year. It like. Why not? It's a bit like B disclosure statements. Just do it every year and get it out of the way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the, getting on to the licensees, obviously they have a different, they have a variety of views in relation to this. Yeah. Uh, but I suppose what you're seeing is the need to move away from the licensee policies. And it's actually more about a client retention and client satisfaction journey more than a licensee policy to get these yeah. things done. Yeah, it, it's to me, it's it's do the right thing by the client. I mean, as I said originally through this, it's why why does it matter? Like, who cares if you're doing something too much? The client doesn't know that you're doing it too much, or or doesn't know that you're not doing it enough. So just just reiterate it. Yep, this is this is to keep you on track. This is to keep you on track. It's just like a train. Choo, 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 choo. <laughs> you keep them on so- track. Let's keep keep the clients on track. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was just how you were identifying the, let's call them the scared clients or the overreacting clients. So you go through these preferences and it's going to flash a giant yellow light or red light that there's some clients that will be oversensitive to the volatility. They may still be a growth investor, say, but they're going to be sensitive to the volatility. What do you do as a result of finding out that information? That's what I love. Depending on timeframes and all the science behind True Profile, somebody can be a growth growth portfolio, but their sensitivity to losses, as you said, is like skyrocket up. Um, they're not in their majority quartile. And so therefore, when you look at that and see that, and understand the report, you can then have those deeper conversations because you know this client is going to react. So why wait until there is a market crash or, or something happening? Educate the client. I usually say to the client, I know this is what you're going to do if it happens. And it's amazing how many in initially until they get to know me and and you know they've had second review, fourth review, third review, sixth review, will say, no, I'm not like that. Yeah, they are (laughs) because it comes back down the track if you haven't and you can educate the shit out of a client and they're still only going to remember what they want to remember. So Yes, absolutely. And it's it's, cool. It's really interesting because we all would have one of those one of those clients that we've met and we got we knew in advance just the intuitive nature of an advisor. We know that they're going to be a nervous investor. And so we kind of hold those (laughs) <laughs> well, maybe there's two, but we know we we know our gut tells us that we have a few nervous investors, but then this is a this is a scientific process over the top of it to identify those ones that um we didn't even know were going to be nervous until you're in it. So obviously during COVID is one example that we know the stock market fell and all advisors would have had some type of uh client questions. And that ranges uh, quite significantly across advice practices. But then I found that there's always like one or two that you just didn't expect when you did the traditional risk profiling, because it doesn't really identify the loss aversion. Uh, So we always had this one or two that that caught us by surprise. And typically they were like quite educated, sophisticated, but then they didn't like losing money. That's right. Exactly. And and that's why... It's great to then resend it out again. It doesn't have to be at the review. It, it you know, it can be any time throughout the year. You send it out and say, "Let's just get this back in check. Can you please do this again for me?" And they're more than happy because you know their little hearts pumping, like you mm. know, because they they are nervous and everything. So they're more than happy to go. Yep, yep. Let's let's double check. Let's do it. And it's amazing how many times that it still comes back to where it was. So. The sensitivity may be a lot higher, but their risk profile as in the true profile of is still where they they are. But it's mm. just giving that education process back to them because you know they're they're feeling, you know, a little a bit worried. A little nervous. And that's a that's a great education to read at that, is that you're you're acknowledging once again through that process that yes, Mr. Client or Mrs. Client, you are nervous. But you're still in the right investment allocation for your longer term preferences. But you're just going to feel a little bit worse than the 
other people through this journey because you've got a higher risk aversion. Doesn't mean we should change the the strategy and the path, but it's just you you will be a little bit more sensitive uh, to that to that path. Correct, and then that allows the advisor then to put a path of educating into place for them, and and just knowing that if something happens, maybe it's a case of sending something out. You know, if an event has happened, so just to to reconfirm that it's okay. And, and look, leave it up to the client. Do you want this three monthly, six monthly, or twelve monthly? Mm. Let the client choose how when they want to do it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's minimum month, uh, minimum as in Annu- annually. annually. Yeah. And from a business perspective, Louise, how how does this software and your attitude to risk profiling every year? How's that made your business more efficient or quicker, or can you serve more clients as a result? Well, then th- those nervous ones aren't ringing anymore because I've educated them. So, Good. so it makes it efficient. You know, the, this staff know to send it out with the link in the My Prosperity for it to be completed. It tells you when it's done. You then uh, send out another follow up when it's not. Um, but most clients. It's not a half-hour job. It's not a 10-minute job. It's literally six questions, slide the scale, and you know, most people get it done in two, three minutes. Mm. And I've found the, the traditional risk profiling process of, a let's oh. say, a paper form, this, this may take the client and the advisor 30 minutes or 45 minutes to complete because there's a lot of leading the witness as well as educating as well as getting confused and asking you for help so i think the the big takeaway in terms of the time invested is that we've shortened the the process of identifying their preferences we can therefore reinvest some of the saved time in educating the client but it's it's very specific education based on their preferences so it's not a shotgun approach of education it's just i'm going to teach you the three things that are relevant to your profile uh and then the client's going to walk away more satisfied through that and you've already shown us that this is a this is a a link that gets sent out to clients so they can do it literally on their mobile phone in front of you uh, or yes. in front of you on the zoom call uh, right. and then and that way they're able to do these things uh, with you or without you but very quickly and easily on their mobile phone as we know everyone has their mobile phone in their hand the entire time exactly and client expectations now are definitely around that it that all journeys and processes should be as good as the iPhone so yes doing a paper uh, fact find or a paper uh, risk profile uh, just confuses and surprises clients, I think, as well at the end of, at the end of the day. Totally. The amount of times with a paper-based where a client would say, oh, I'm in between those two. So, you know, if the scores were 20, 30, I'd have to give them 25. I mean, it, it, it was like being a school teacher, which, oh, I, yeah, we know how all of us get on with school teachers, but it's a case of yeah, this is in the palm. You can do it straight away. You can guide them as in here, do the six questions. It's five minutes, not even that, two minutes. They do it and then you can present the results immediately if you if you wanted to. If you it's not to. an issue. Absolutely. So thank you, Louise. This has been a great uh, conversation to teach us as advisors uh, a new way in which we can talk to our clients about identifying their preferences talking them to them about their loss aversion. But the main thing that I've heard from you today is obviously the better customer service, client service that we can have uh, through this. So we've got a better retention of clients. We've got better ongoing conversations with clients, therefore happier clients. So happy client means a happy financial advisor and referrals through that process, which is amazing. And then the second element is this business efficiency which is also vitally important. So we're actually speeding up parts of our business process because we're not using paper forms and and leading clients through a variety of education elements that aren't relevant for them. So thank you very much for joining us today, Lou. Uh, It's been a great conversation. Uh, And obviously, if anyone wants to chat to Lou 
about her experience. Uh, her details are through the uh, Ensemble app and through the podcast. And we look forward to seeing your journey going forward, Lou. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye.